welcome back to the Rapture, or whatever it is exactly that this is. For whatever reason, this chapter transition isn't quite as perfectly paced as the last one. I had to cut out quite a bit of wandering before the music kicks in, and I'll have to stall a bit before it finishes. Sorry. I messed up, Frank, but I'd done my time. They shouldn't keep on punishing me. Some folk won't let go, Reese, and they've got nothing better to do than to poke their noses into other people's business. There's nothing you can do about it, son. I'm doing a good job. I'm working hard. I swear, Mrs. Graves thinks I'll start nicking stuff if she turns her back for a second. This is all right. She's one of the good ones. Yeah, but she's not exactly honest with her husband about what she gets up to. None of that. You're angry about people judging you. Don't be so fast to judge others. <sighs> I'm sorry, Frank. Keep your gob shut, your nose clean, and your head down. Do you think you can manage that? Gob, nose, head. I've got it. And steer clear of that Rachel girl. If I've seen you two making eyes at each other, then so's her dad. And you don't want Sam Baker coming round after you. Now, pass me that socket spanner, and we'll see if we can get this wheel back on. For those of you keeping score at home, this is the second time that a character's theme music has specifically referenced the Nightjar. That, along with the fact that one of the birdwatching books we can collect for an achievement is titled The Nightjar, leads me to believe that this bird holds some kind of thematic significance. I have absolutely no idea what it is. This is just one of the many lyrical coincidences we could find if we scrutinise the soundtrack for long enough. I wouldn't be wholly surprised to learn that these are only there because somebody decided it would be nice if the soundtrack had some lyrical coincidences. Here's another. I am convinced that the tree before us is the morning tree referenced in Wendy's theme music. I don't have a lot of hard evidence for this. It's just a big prominent tree which presumably houses some birds and is surrounded by swaying wheat. I think the fact that it would be neat if it were the same tree is the most compelling argument in favour of that theory. Notice that Frank is waiting for us patiently. Can you see the observatory from there? That's over the ridge, just past the windmill. Oh. You want to live near the station in case you need a quick getaway? Something like that. 
So you and Steven, I'm sensing there's not a lot of love lost there, huh? That's between him, me, and the cows. You're gonna have to explain that one for me. It's nobody else's business. Look, you seem all right to me. You don't want to worry about that lot in the village. Provided I'm left alone, I'm happy. Steven's the one who likes to be at the center of things. <laughs> no change there, then. <laughs> Francis Appleton. You are a bad man. No wonder your sister won't talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> There's a thing or two to unpack here, but it can wait until after we've stared at a rock and listened to some lovely music. Under the microscope, you could see how the light was following the cellular structure of its wings. The neural simplicity of the insects seems to prevent a full-blown infestation, so there's none of the hemorrhaging I'm seeing in the birds. But Stephen's wrong. This isn't an attack. It's a byproduct of the attempt to communicate. It's getting smarter. It's learning as it adapts. I'm confident of a breakthrough soon. That conversation by the tree is one of the precious few times so far that we've seen Kate in any way happy. Kate definitely seems to get on well with Frank. This probably has something to do with his belief that one shouldn't stick their nose too closely into the business of others. Kate's primary grievance with this place is that she can feel everybody staring at her, figuratively and literally, so a friend with an outlook like Frank's would be a welcome relief. This is also the first we're hearing about a rift between Frank and Wendy. Given what we've already seen of Wendy, we can probably make a pretty good guess at the source of that rift. In what seems to be a running theme lately, the aspect of this story with which we're most familiar is how it ends. But that chapter of Frank and Mary's story is characterised primarily by Jeremy's intervention and Wendy's reaction to it, rather than anything particularly to do with Frank and Mary themselves. Breaker, Breaker 9, call in on 9. This is Lost Cowboy looking for anyone out there. Hello? Breaker 1-9. Breaker traveling Sherlock. Charlie, you out there? Over. My, my Hello? Family, my my wife that? and kids. You yeah, know perfectly well what you've got to do. I can't do it. Don't ask me to do it. You're asking me to sign their death warrant. My own family. Damn it, don't you think I'm aware of that? I'll still be here when you drop the fucking stuff. No. Don't you lecture me about no. sacrifice, you, you spineless stupid, little shit. stupid bastard. If you're so full of ideas, you come here and try dealing with it. Tell them the time when we had a choice is over. Tell them to do it. You've got to do it now. I think we've gotten about as far into this game as we can get before I have to start addressing the elephant in the room. 
The conversation we just overheard between Stephen and Clive, the end of Wendy's chapter, and all the canisters of VX gas that we've been finding lying around, tell between them a story that offers not a whole lot of room for interpretation. It certainly offers a good explanation for why everybody is dead. As for why everybody's gone to the rapture though, that one's still open. By this point in the game, most of the broad strokes of the A plot will be pretty apparent to us one way or the other. The only reason I'm not going to expound on them in commentary right now is because they're going to be the subject of one of the game's later chapters, so all things in time. We've got plenty to be concerned with for the time being. It just seems a bit odd, that's all. She's just over the hill. Why can't we go and collect her? You heard the radio. Try to minimise contact with different groups of people. It might be spreading that way. Besides, Father Jeremy told me that Lizzie Graves said they're all fine. They're still planning on putting on their show. So how does Father Jeremy know what's going on at the camp if we're all supposed to be staying at home? <sighs> a, a special dispensation for the clergy or something. I'm sure Rachel will be all right. She seems to live at the camp these days anyway. She's 16, Sam. It's going to happen. I was pregnant when I was 17. Yeah, well, that's why I'm worried about what Rachel gets up to. Come on, give me that other case. We'll still be here at midnight if we don't get a bloody move on. I can't understand why the car wouldn't start. We'll have to get someone out to take a look at it. The area we're in now is a secret backtracking path. There's not really very much to it, it's just a footpath that runs from Yorton Village to Titworth Forest to Appleton Farms. There's no quote-unquote gameplay reason to come here, although there are a handful of conversations for us to find. It's just a marginally faster way to get from Appleton Farms to Yorton Village if you decide you want to do that. Or if you want to get an achievement. You have to make a decision, Lizzie. Whoops. Especially now. I ventured out too far into the village, and now you all know my terrible secret. It's true, I confess it. This LP is not a single coherent playthrough. It is a forgery born of patience and save file manipulation. It needed to be this way because every now and then, the light orbs just don't behave properly. They get stuck, or glitch out, or do weird things. And every time they do, I have to restart the save file. You may also have noticed the time of day changing. This is because the time of day is actually tied to the area you're in, rather than, say, your progress through the plot. Because of the gimmick where the time changes to midnight during the big events and between chapters, this can actually be a surprisingly subtle effect. Unfortunately, not all of the time changes that don't go through a midnight phase are quite so graceful. Sometimes they have to change the visibility in the skybox quite dramatically, and if you happen to be looking, it can be quite jarring. Thank you. Well, uh, for, for the last 20 years as a semi-professional, yes, I suppose you could call it that. Well, we run a club here. A mix of hobby stargazers and more serious scientists. They sometimes let us use the observatory telescopes. But normally, it's just a, a back garden sort of thing. Well, no, that's the thing. It's not like you need the Jodrell Bank to see it. There's just too many of them. Of course I'm serious. Go outside and count them. It's Orion, for God's sake. It's not difficult to find. Well, you tell me how many bloody stars are supposed to be on the belt, then. This is the first we've heard from Graham since we saw him getting harassed by Stephen right at the start of the game. It's also the only time we'll ever hear anybody explaining in detail something that's wrong with the sky. Namely, the Belt of Orion, arguably the most famous constellation in the galaxy, is wrong and has too many stars in it. It isn't clear exactly who Graham's talking to here, but the fact that he is talking to someone raises a lot of very good questions. How much has the astronomy world at large been paying attention to whatever's going on in the skies above Yorton? For that matter, why haven't we heard anything from literally any other staff at Vallis? Graham has observed a phenomenon that is simultaneously of extreme interest to any astronomer, and also not very difficult to verify. So why is he having such a hard time getting anybody to listen? Then again, if I were a professional astronomer, and somebody called me up and tried to tell me that they were able to see Orion from the Northern Hemisphere in June. 
I might not believe them either. Well, okay. That's not really a fair observation to make of the plot. That's just noticing a mistake that the writers made. Still though, all the questions stand. Stephen and Clive can't have enacted the quarantine entirely on their own, so one way or another, someone else is taking notice of all this. For all we know, these same events might be happening elsewhere in the world simultaneously. Groucher never really engages with these questions or with these possibilities, and that's fine. Its story has a focus. But search your feelings, viewer, and you will know someone, somewhere on the internet, is rapidly incrementing a sins counter right now. You knew? Wade called me in about six weeks after, once he thought I could cope with knowing. I cannot ever repay you for what you did. She was a good woman, Frank. The best. You should come back to church. Back to the community, you're missed. I hate him, Father. I can't get down on my knees and pretend otherwise. And I don't understand why you don't hate him too. I try my hardest not to, Frank. It goes against the job description somewhat. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. We have to trust him. Even when his methods are hidden from view. Maybe see you on Sunday. Jeremy talks about his faith here, but I don't think he's just talking about his faith in God. Not simply because that would contradict a reading of Jeremy's chapter that frames those events around Jeremy struggling with his faith, but because I think there's an alternate explanation that makes more thematic sense. That conversation's most important revelation arguably comes in its first two words. Jeremy didn't know that Frank knew what he had done for Mary. I think the faith of which Jeremy speaks is his own faith in himself. Jeremy did what he did for moral reasons which he stands by, but it's easy to imagine that conviction wavering when Wendy turned him into a pariah hated by everyone. Or so he thought. Now, months after the fact, he learns that Frank has always known and always been grateful for what he did, and so his faith in himself is rewarded. He would later be vindicated further when Wendy came to reconcile with him. Until then though, Jeremy's conviction would have been founded entirely upon faith. He may well have thought he had no choice but to believe. I hung up on Stephen. He doesn't understand. Even if he were here to experience it directly, I'm still not sure he would. There has to be a way of consolidating, of offering reciprocal amplification to the signal. Frank is also subject to both a figurative and a literal reading of his opinions about God. Frank professes to have only enough faith in God to hate him, and it's as plausible as with Jeremy that he uses the name of God to talk about himself. A crisis of personal faith as much as of religious. Or maybe that's wrong and maybe he is just talking to a priest about religion. Or maybe it's both. Maybe the real revelation is that we're reading a story written by a writer who appreciates that sometimes there are more important things in life than making sure that there's only ever one perfect canonical truth. We certainly can't say that this is just some cynical attempt to leverage ambiguity to create lots of speculation for everybody. This is an example of ambiguity perfectly suiting the purposes of the work. We don't need to worry about arguing about what happened, because we can get right into the much more interesting argument over what it all meant. The radio telescope in Tower 6 is burned out. Background radiation coming in from the Penrose region is off the scale. It's like mathematics is bending along with the light. Everything is bathed in a strange glow. My face is still numb from the burn. One of the incidental plot details that the game not really so much as forgets, but doesn't really go out of its way to remind you is that when whatever it was that happened up at the observatory happened, Stephen and Kate were scarred, literally and figuratively, by the light coming in through the telescope. 
Kate, of course, has been locked up in the observatory ever since the event got started, and nobody has spoken to her, much less set eyes upon her. Stephen, on the other hand, has been out and about, and every now and then somebody he talks to will make an offhand comment about there being something wrong with his face. Not everything needs to be a grand revelation that we can make fan theory videos about. Sometimes good stories are just full of little incidental details. How's your sister, Frank? We've not spoken since the funeral. Ah, I see. Well, uh, listen, I, I, I did rather wonder if you might do me a bit of a favour and check in on her, see if she's all right. Dr. Wade, if they drop the bomb, there'd be no left but cockroaches and Wendy Boyles. <laughs> it's a bit odd, really. There's an old chap, John Coles, regular visitor at Lakeside, went walkabout sometime last night. Now it appears Mrs. Boughton has done the same. Enid? Well, that'd be clever. They amputated her leg last spring. <laughs> yes, that's the thing. I've also got a surgery full of people with nosebleeds and headaches. The council are saying influenza, but I've been practicing for 35 years and I'm not convinced. I just wondered if you might pop by and see her. Even if I did, do you really think she'd let me in? Fine. Forget it. I'll see her. Leave it to me. Oh, and Frank, call the hospital and get them to collect all this stuff. It's been eight months. Here's an incidental detail about Frank that is important. A detail that's picked up and referenced and reinforced in something like half of the conversations in which we see him. Frank is kind of a conspiracy theorist. He's not like a flat earther or whatever kind of inside job truther was in vogue in 1984. He's just vaguely, but consistently, distrustful of the people in power. In however many contexts you might consider there to be people in power. Unlike with Wendy and her grief and her philosophical naturalism, I don't have an armchair psychoanalysis ready to go on this character trait that I'm particularly confident in, but I still think it's worth pointing out, simply because of how often we're going to see it reinforced over the course of this chapter. Just now, for example, Frank was talking to Dr. Wade, who says that the government says that whatever's going on in the village is flu, but Dr. Wade doesn't trust that analysis at all. And Frank thinks, hmm. Bloody England! You can't just stop the train, stop people travelling about the place. I don't like it, Frank. I don't like it at all. Well, nobody liked it. No sense sweating cobs over it. Yeah, folk all riled about it, giving me grief. I didn't stop the bloody trains, did I? And did they give me any warning? No, they bloody didn't. Yesterday, it's all like keeping calm, Howard, minor disruptions, and today it's all government edicts and not until further notice, and you'll manage. Half the village has vanished. It's a couple of people. It's hardly half the village. Oh, right now. You forget, I've seen things. I was in the Falklands. I tell you, I got out the old air raid siren to test it this morning. Air raid siren? What on earth are you going to do with one of those? I found it in the station storeroom. Took it home, stuck it under the bed. Thought it might be worth something one day. Oh, damn it! It's all right. It's just a nosebleed. Here, use my Yankee. It's clean. Oh, thanks, Frank. Thanks. It's been getting like a bloody drain all day. Here, Frank plays the straight man to Howard. And yet, what must he think, listening to all that? I said I wasn't prepared to do a psychoanalysis, and I stand by that, but I'm always happy to do a thematic reading. Thematically, Frank's broad distrust of the powers that be mirrors his own complete and very specific lack of trust in himself, possibly also a sense of a lack of control. After all, one of the classical appeals of the conspiracy theory is that it provides an out from having to grapple with the notion of our uncontrolled place in an uncaring universe. A universe in which all of all things routinely happen to people who don't deserve them for absolutely no reason. Or, which is possibly worse, awful things are done by people for reasons we don't understand. Even when it's not particularly rational. Even when it doesn't make any sense at all. It is, for reasons we shouldn't discount, just easier sometimes 
to believe that these awful things can be the work of someone who is, at least, in control and acting for understandable reasons. All the power spiked with the last discharge and then went out again, and I could see the aurora dancing around Tower 6. At the same time, the headache intensified, and I think I began to hallucinate. Old and new memories are clashing and tumbling around me. <laughs> We're on the cusp of a breakthrough. I can feel it. The rationality and root cause of it aside, though, it bears remembering at this point that Frank was ultimately vindicated in his distrust. Earlier in this chapter, we saw a scene in which he stumbled on Stephen and Clive's plot to, well, bomb the valley with nerve gas. It occurs to me there was a scene in Jeremy's chapter, which I think is chronologically earlier, in which Jeremy says to Frank, the government will send planes, and Frank responds, oh, they'll send planes, all right. I mean, damn. How is Graham? Morning, Frank. You look a little out of breath. What's up? Bloody observatory gates have failed. I came to see if I could borrow a ladder. Bloody hell, there's a 12-foot drop the other side of that wall. I'm old, but I'm not useless, no. Can I borrow the ladder? No one said you were useless. Reese. Hi, Frank. Fetch Graham the ladder, will you, lad? It's round the side of the barn. Will do. And you be careful. I don't want Stephen Appleton coming mithering round here because you've broken your neck. This is important. You've been with Lizzie. You mess with her, I'll knock your bloody block off. I son. need to track the pattern. It's critical. What are you talking about, Stephen? People are sick. Birds are dying. My cows are dead. Where's Kate? Still up at the tower for all I know. I could recalibrate the radial coordinates on the primary oscillators. If that holds up... Stephen, where's Kate? What's going on? Just keep out of my way. Rapture strikes me as the kind of production that probably considers itself above having a plot thread in which a conspiracy theorist stumbles upon an actual conspiracy and goes to warn everybody but nobody believes him because he's a conspiracy theorist. No, that's just not the kind of story we're dealing with. Not only have they basically already played that card with Graham in his little plot thread where he's trying to explain that there's something wrong with the sky, but a level up from that, it just seems completely thematically wrong for a game that literally opens with the premise that everybody is dead, to hang any narrative tension on the notion that the crisis might be averted somehow. Instead, the story is about how Frank, the distrustful numbers station enthusiast who has only enough faith in God to hate him, discovers that he's about to be made into a pawn in a battle between two men and an actual higher power who's actually in control. Running with his vindication, Frank's instinct is to defy the conspiracy and out the truth, even though this places him in opposition to Stephen, who's desperately trying to keep everything contained, and possibly everybody alive. The tension isn't so much over whether Frank's noble quest for truth and justice will ultimately succeed or fail, but discovering how the events of his life led him to be in this… absurd position. Once again, it's not so much a story about exactly what happened to him, but a story about what all this might have meant to him. Never mentioned anything about them sickening yesterday. I checked them last night on the way back and they were fine. I woke up this morning and the whole lot had gone. Tell me, Charlie, have you heard any birds today? Well, I've not really been paying any attention. That sister of mine reckons they're dropping out the sky all around the reeking. And Dr. Wade reckons there's sick folk all over the village. Meg said not to bother trying to get deliveries out. Said the quarantine in the whole valley. 
I reckon it's best we just sit it out. It'll all come right, Frank. This'll all come right? Yeah, right. I am sorry about your cows, Frank. But when things settle down, they'll see you all right. There's got to be provision for this sort of thing. You want to listen to the radio more? Mm -hmm. Things don't seem like they're settling down at all. I tell you, Charlie, something big is happening. It is at about this point when I was recording this that it suddenly occurred to me that the ringing telephone that we heard earlier doesn't seem to be mentioned in my guide for this chapter. So I went back to check on it. Here's why. It's not actually in this chapter. It's actually in one of the very last areas we can reach in the game, and it's on the other side of a one-way shortcut back. It seems like something of an oversight on the part of the developers to have allowed that phone to be audible from here. Maybe if development and patching of this game hadn't stopped, we might have seen that fixed. Something else that occurred to me, literally as I was recording this commentary, is that I had somehow managed to choose one of the very few routes around this chapter that leaves until pretty late, one of the most central revelations about Frank's backstory. I guess this is an occupational hazard of dealing in non-linear narrative design. It turns out that allowing the player to make plot discoveries in a non-prescribed order can have an unstable effect on the narrative. In another playthrough, the minor plot event that we're about to see might have been the thematic building block for all the rest of the content in this chapter. Instead, it's going to be the keystone that makes all of these other events make sense. I think this is another example of that writing thing. So he managed to get the transfer to the observatory then? Well, this Catherine woman must have swung it. Now he says they're getting married before they come back. It's typical. Why can't he just wait till he's home? Are you going to go? Goodness, no. It'll be full of her people. I expect they do things differently. You want to come in for a cup of tea? Oh, I don't think so. Oh, for Christ's sake, woman, it's been eight months. Won't you just come in and talk? Well, you didn't want to talk when Mary was still alive. You and Charlie Tate out drowning your sorrows when you should have been at home nursing your wife. You can be a nasty old bird, Wendy Boyles. Frank Appleton, you come back here and say that again. Our mother always said you were a bad egg. You'll come a cropper, you mark my words. I honestly think the developers erred slightly in not making that scene a major plot event, because it's kind of at the centre of Frank's backstory. Up until now, you might have been forgiven for thinking that the death of Mary was just a sad thing that happened to Frank in the past. But it turns out that, in a way, the exact opposite is true. The death of his wife is an event that Frank missed, both on an emotional level and, to a large extent, a literal one. This is what underlies Frank's lack of trust in himself, and possibly also his lack of trust in anyone or anything else. There you go. Oh, thanks, Frank. Let's should get it out of the way. I don't know what happened. It just died on me. Give it another go. Oh, I only just put petrol in it as well. Robert's taken the other car into town. I wish he'd get back. He promised me that he'd be back this morning. You think he's off on another bender? Oh, I can't police him all the time, Frank. He's not a child. What's going on, Lizzie? Nothing. You're seeing Stephen again, aren't you? You two can't keep pithering on like this. If Robert hasn't already worked it out, he soon will. Oh, not if he carries on drinking the way he is. Shit. Pardon my French, but bloody shit thing. Why won't it start? Come on, I'll give you a lift.
the telescope up and running again, but the pattern has burnt itself onto the lens. It's soaking up light and radiation, but not routing it anywhere. So I can only guess that it's using it as an energy source in its attempts to communicate. It needs more power. I wonder if I could boost the reception by using multiple towers. Frank's story has a lot of very tidy symmetries with that of his sister, Wendy. Each of them lost a partner. Wendy, if anything, over-engaged with her grief, allowing it to affect and consume her until it morphed into her unshakable conviction in the God-given nature of her own rightness. Frank chose escapism far ahead of time, under-engaging with his grief, and the lucidity afforded him by that decision caused him to see his own fault so clearly that it destroyed his self-esteem. Wendy, in discussing Mary's death with Jeremy, tells him that his intervention was an affront to God. Frank, discussing the same thing, simply says that he hates God and can't understand why Jeremy doesn't too. Wendy's conviction and Frank's self-loathing were each reinforced by their interpretations of this tragedy. Frank! Frank, for God's sake, stop! Keep back, you bastard. I know what you've done. Where's Lizzie? Where is she? I've got to find her. You stay away. Someone's got to warn them. Someone's got to stop it. You can't stop it. You have to understand. You hate me, I get that. But if we don't do this, it's not just the valley, it's everything, Frank. It's all gone. You're talking bollocks. You can't stop it! Jesus! You take one step closer, I'll bash your bloody skull in, I swear to God. All right, all right, I'm going. But if you see Lizzie, tell her to get out. There's still time. Please, Frank, for her, not me. If you're that bloody caring, you can save her yourself. Don't you get it? I have to stay. Someone has to be here to confirm that everyone is dead. Wendy and Frank each have their experiences thrown into sharp relief by the extraordinary events surrounding the pattern. Wendy, seeing her neighbours disappear and her beloved birds fall out of the sky around her, finally has her faith shaken. Frank, on the other hand, stumbles onto Stephen and Clive's plot to bomb the valley, and is emboldened. Wendy sought her redemption in person from the man her faith had driven her to persecute. Frank, on the other hand, sees in the crisis an opportunity to redeem himself, enacting a plan that he must have known was futile simply so that he could say that this time he didn't run away. Even if he failed. Even if nobody ever found out. Arguably because there was a chance that nobody might find out. Of course, the game can't escape from having to ludonarratively imply that somebody, us, did eventually find out about this. Maybe this fact cheapens Frank's final decision. Or maybe it just goes to show that in the end, as with Jeremy, Frank's faith in himself was eventually rewarded. I'll leave that distinction up to you. My name is Frank Jacob Appleton. And if you're listening to this, then maybe Stephen was right, and by sending the planes, he stopped it all getting worse. It's a beautiful morning. I wasn't there when Mary died. I was too scared. So I went to the pub instead. What will be, will be, Frank, she said. And I just want you to face it with me. And I didn't. But I will now. I will face it with you now, Mary. They're coming. <laughs> 